Buy my novel, Escape from the Village, from major booksellers online. Go to escapevillage.com. Subscribe to my Substack. Go to fountainheadforum.substack.com. Thank you. Welcome to the party, pal. This is Fountainhead Forum 124. I'm talking again to Jesse Walker. Uh, he is an editor at Reason Magazine. Uh, he's a uh, Worked at Liberty many years ago. He's written a couple books. Uh, he's, uh, and as I would like to say, Jesse's probably the most colorful libertarian I know. And we're going to talk about liberty in movies. How are you, Jesse? I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm fine. You know, Jesse, outside of some of the actors and, you know, people who actually work in the industry, I know, I don't know anybody who knows more about movies than you. Uh, what it, can you tell it, I mean, critics do because they see stuff yeah. as, as it comes out. And I'm always, especially yeah. since I became a father, I like feel like I see almost nothing as it comes out. You know, I'm uh, catching yeah. up on stuff years later. But um, yeah, yeah. I, it, it's my hobby. I watch a lot. Jesse likes to publish his uh, favorite movies of every year. It's a, of his perpetual three dot column, which he doesn't really write that much stuff there anymore. But he always writes his various commentaries on movies. And I said, Jesse, what are. You know, we've certainly seen libertarian values in some movies. What are, what do you think are some really great movies that libertarians should watch? Yes, yeah, so ones that are specifically, um, well, a lot of the, a lot of the answers are obvious, and I should reel them off so that people don't get sick. That well, I mean, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, the outlaw Josie Wales. I mean, there's some that are very explicitly libertarian. Um, the, I mean. The outlaw Josie Wales, of course, has that whole um, you know, sort of monologue against government in it, and it's about um, people, uh, you know, from different uh, backgrounds forming this little community out on the frontier, out away from the, well, including you know, Indian background, out on the frontier, away from the, um, as much as they can, the long arm of the state. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Based on the Ken Kesey novel, um, takes place in an asylum, and people remember it as being sort of very critical of the authoritarianism of one of these old school um, uh, uh, mental asylums. But also includes, I mean, like, there's a sequence that's basically defending the right of people to make. Uh, I mean, the, the characters want to keep um, gambling even though they keep losing, and um, the movie is pretty explicitly in the favor of your right to keep. Um, risking your money stupidly if you want to. I mean, it, it's a, uh, it, it's a, there, there's a lot of sort of libertarian thinking in that. And, and there are some other movies like that that sort of always come up when people talk about um, libertarian ideas in film. Um, I should try to think of like, what are some more um, obscure ones? Um, uh, one that doesn't often get mentioned is you ever see Fast, Cheap and Out of Control, the Errol Morris documentary? No, I'm not fast, cheap, and out of control. That's a yeah. I mean, it's real. I mean, he sort of interviews these four eccentric people. Um, like one of them studies mole rats, and and so on. And and people just sort of often talk about it as this is sort of fun documentary about these eccentric people, which it is. But every one of the um, every one of the sort of four storylines isn't the word really because it's a documentary but you know is is in one way or another about spontaneous order you know i mean it, it, it there there is kind of, and and people trying to shape it and sort of different approaches to it so that's uh another one that's kind of um uh i don't know maybe you could call it left libertarian um, there's the gleaners and i that's another really interesting documentary agnes varda made it a uh, french director and it's about these people sort of taking advantage of the sort of customary right to um, to pick up um, discarded um, uh, crops and you know, food after they've they've gone through and glean what's left after the uh, the crop. Um, I'm forgetting a very basic uh, gerund here. Um, the the, the um, harvesting um, is it, complete, and this is sort of a. But uh, she uses this as sort of a springboard for looking at all these sorts of forms of um, uh, sort of voluntary cooperation in the interstices of society. Um, boy, I'm, I'm uh, if I if I if I know this would be your first question, I would have had like a a a, a, a list at my fingertips. Um, oh, you know one that um, nobody talks about. It's Evil of Frankenstein. Uh, this is a horror movie from the Hammer Studios in the early mm -hmm. 60s and they had um 
in most of their Frankenstein movies, and they they when they put them out from the fifties through uh, I think the early seventies, late sixties, early seventies. Yes. Most of them, their their Doctor Frankenstein character is completely villainous. Um, but yeah. there's a couple where he's not, and in this one, he is basically presented as this almost sort of Randian hero defying the state and and superstition. And it's the um, the sort of the three um, uh, forces that he ends up sort of uh, uh, having to overcome um, are like the sort of this superstitious religious beliefs, the direct repression of the state. And there's also, um, you have the sort of the, the fickle nature of the uh, real world businessman who is at first willing to help him, but also can be, I, I don't want to say bought off, uh, because I don't, it, 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 it's not exactly what happens, but kind of a, let's say can be uh, their self-interest in the context of repression can take them in a different direction. Um, and he really, I mean, I, I, uh, it, he really kind of uh, feels like kind of a Randian figure. It's, it's a very different take on Dr. Frankenstein um, that a lot of libertarians would enjoy. Um, yeah. From like 61, 62, 63, somewhere in there. So that's a few. You know? yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's not, yeah, see, I mean, Peter Cushing is the only name I recognize in that movie, but yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, well, that one's an obscure one. That's one, yeah. one of those things where I was watching, I don't know, Turner Classic movies, or it might have just been late night tv and this comes on and i'm expecting all right i'm going to have just sort of a fun maybe pretty good maybe pretty dumb um you know frankenstein uh horror movie and then i'm sort of watching it as it goes on and say wow this is actually really political and then interesting and mostly kind of sympathetic ways so yeah there's certainly been plenty of frankenstein movies done out there you know i don't uh yeah you know one one movie that first comes to my mind more recently, of course, was Dallas Buyers Club. You know, I have not seen that. This is an example yeah. of stuff that came out after my kids was, were born that yeah. I didn't um, go back to. But that's about like a, a marijuana dealer, right? The, well, uh, no, da Dallas Buyers Club starts out with the guy who, who gets AIDS. And I, I think he gets it. I, I don't believe he's a, I believe he's actually, uh, you know, he gets AIDS. I'm, I don't remember the circumstances, but. This is in the 80s, so he starts these, starts using these experimental drugs, and he naturally has to go up against, you know, all the bureaucrats who don't want to let him do this. Um, right. And he has his friends, and that actually, port it's fictionalized, but it actually portrays, you know, a man who's supposed to be Anthony Fauci is very negatively and just portrays this government. And what's interesting is that because the protagonist because the protagonist is an AIDS patient, the left loved it. I mean, it's it's kind of mm. interesting how you can put in these pro-capitalist messages and the left will love the movie even though it's a pro-capitalist message. But because the, the hero is an AIDS patient, that's that, that suddenly goes in under the radar. And yet at the same time, conservatives didn't really say much of anything about it for the same reasons, I think. Yeah, I, I remember when that came out, and it was like a an Oscar nominee, right? I mean, it actually... Yeah, I mean, it, Matthew it, McConaughey got Best Actor for it, and uh, there was a few other things out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, it, it got... It was well-received, as I remember. <laughs> yeah. I hadn't, I hadn't well seen it, I have to say. So there, I've already undone your um, your introduction. You, there's a movie you've seen, and I haven't. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's very interesting, too, though, that you, you... This is, I think, a way you can kind of... But what put things over on the left is if you, may, you know, make this, you know, just, you know, just make the protagonist the right group, make sure he's from the right group, and suddenly they'll be okay with that. You know, it's. <clears throat> I, I've jokingly said, you know, what would happen if you made, you know, made Howard Rourke a black guy? There, yeah. there is a pretty um, long. Um, history of kind of ideological flexible movies too where you can yeah. um you're open it's open to different readings depending on what you're taking to the uh the story mm -hmm. if you know what i mean it's um there was an interesting one and i wrote about this in reason a few years ago when i did a sort of a long piece on the blacklist um called terror in a texas town which is a um a Western that I think is mostly remembered because it has like this really bizarre showdown where one of the, um, one of the people has a sort of a gun has a whaling harpoon. Um, 
but it was written by you know Dalton Trumbo uh, during his, while he was blacklisted, um, you know, uh, behind a front. Um, and Trumbo, of course, was a communist, um, and he's trying to slip these kind of subversive messages into the stuff he was writing, you know, to the extent he could. Um, so he has this um, movie where there's a wealthy businessman um, seizing property from independent farmers, using both uh, private violence and uh, a corrupt government. And it's actually a very libertarian movie. Um, it's a, it, and it's set like, you know, like the victims are these, like what you were talking about, these Mexican farmers and so on. I mean, he was like doing so much to sort of camouflage his sort of um, people against the system that he wound up, you know, creating this thing where it was about um, yeah. uh, these people's property rights being violated. Um, and, you know, so there, there's, uh, and there are a few other ones like that um, from the kind of, um, you know, the old Hollywood days, so the Blacklist and before. Um, yeah. And I'm not even quite sure how to describe them politically. Um, because, again, Dalton Trump, I mean, he's somebody who, I mean, he was blacklisted. But back when he was, before he was blacklisted, you know, he was trying to work to, um, if not blacklist, but sort of keep from working people whose politics he didn't like. I mean, he can be, he's not a great human being, although he was a talented writer. Um, but, you know, sometimes people wind up producing things despite themselves um, because yeah. of the situation they're in. Um, did I ever try to get you to watch, because uh, this is when I liked even yeah. way back in the Port Townsend time, Theodora Goes Wild. Do you know that one? Uh, no, I don't. I see, I see Sterling Hayden and Sebastian Kabat in um, Terror in a Texas Town, but again, not really many names I recognize there. Yeah, it's a... Um, well, actually, the other thing is um, the um, Ned Young, who was the yeah. uh, the villain in that, he was also blacklisted, and this had been, and this was like him sort of working out in front. Um, you know, I, I mean, not with a front, but like sort of like he's it's hard to work behind a friend if you're an actor. So he's actually being cast again in this kind of movement yeah. out of the shadows into work again. Um, and he's actually really good in it. Um, I, uh, I don't know offhand if he was uh, actual communist or just one of these people got kind of roped yeah. in because of what the blacklist was like, but his perf it's one of like yeah. the sort of the great villainous like Western performances of that period. Yeah. Yeah. That's but like I said, another movie that's not really well known. What was that movie you were mentioning? Was... Oh, yeah. The Theodora goes wild is a, um, a screwball comedy from the thirties, 1936. Um, and it's one of those things where you, this person goes out to uh, the countryside, I mean, not the countryside, um, but, you know, a rural area, a small town. Mm -hmm. And the first half is it kind of mocking all these small town prudes yep. and censors and the kind of the way that someone like H.L. Mencken would. And mm -hmm. then uh, the second half, they go back to the city and you find uh, they're mocking all the sort of thinly masked parochialism of the people who think of themselves as urban sophisticates who look down on the small town censor. So it kind of... Um, it uh, I just it, it it goes after both sides and it gets them for both sides for what they deserve in a way that um, yeah. and it's also very funny. I mean, which is the most important thing about a comedy, right? Yeah. Um, so that's another one. Um, yeah, Irene Dunn. Lots, lots, lots of good screwball comedies came out of the '30s. I I think maybe people was just escapism from the current situation or what. But yeah, that's a a good era, era for screwball comedies, though. Yeah, I mean that's when they were invented. You know, it's the, the, the <laughs> yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, also in the '30s. I mean, The Wizard of Oz was a very libertarian movie. I think. I don't know if you agree with me about that, but it's a uh... certainly the uh, certainly the whole thought. You know, of uh, you know people. Uh, being more grant being not as great as you think they are they put out this impression you know like i am oz the great and powerful you know and then the end is him just sort of letting them in on the con he's like well you know those credit they they're no smarter than you are but they have a, a credential they have a diploma you know they're not they, that they're no um have more heart than you do but they have a testimonial you know i mean it was yeah. a i i saw that um yeah I and mean, of course, I grew up watching it every year on TV, but they had this. I took a film class in college. And uh, so I saw that in a big screen with a bunch of um, kids in their late teens, early 20s. And when they got to the line about they have no, they're no smarter than you are, but they have one thing you don't, a diploma, like the entire crowd erupts in like laughter yeah. and cheers because we all sort of knew what was. Yeah, yeah, there's a there's a truth. Yeah, well, and there. 
it also, you know, the, and the main villain, of course, is, you know, the classic example of a Karen, and that would be, you know, Mrs. Gulch, who also becomes the the Wicked yeah. Witch, you know. and uh, yeah. It's certainly and, an anti-authoritarian yeah. movie. Yeah. You know, Libertarian's, like, anti-authoritarian movie. Yeah, and, so. and to her credit, you know, Margaret Hamilton, really, one of the greatest character actresses of all time. I mean, you know, I mean, she was never, she was never good looking enough to be a leading lady, but, you know, just... Uh, she played those kind of roles so well, though. Just you know, the, yeah. Did you, the, did town, you uh, the town busybody or whatever you know? Yeah. Did you remember watching her on Mr. Rogers when you were a kid? Did you? See yeah, that I, I've seen that clip. It's I, yeah, I've seen that clip. It's absolutely brilliant. You know. Yeah. yeah. She hadn't really aged much. You know, there's there's also there, you know she was also on the Adams Family where she was of course playing Morticia's mother. <laughs> oh, I don't. I haven't seen that one. In I several in several that. episodes. Yeah. Yes, I said. Who else but Mark? And doesn't that just? Seem, I mean, doesn't that just seem perfect? Yes. Yeah, so sometimes the casting director is the most <laughs> yeah. important creative force in a. Yeah, and movie. and then of course she's in, and she's also in My Little Chickadee. Uh, you know, playing a. You know, uh, yeah, and you know, it's funny. Her, movie. Yeah, her agent called her, said, "Yeah, they want you in the Wizard Ross." She says, "Oh, I love that book." And she says, "The Wicked Witch." And said, "What else?" <laughs> yeah. yeah. As, as some people like to say, I said, "I just don't realize the witch never took a bath." Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah, it probably smelled pretty bad in that in that castle. Um, yeah. Uh, here's another one. Um, it's sort of obscure. Yeah. Is Death of a Bureaucrat. Um, it's a Cuban movie. It was made in the '60s, um, and one of those things where the um, you slip some stuff past the uh, the censors and maybe get into some trouble for it afterwards. Um, but it's basically it's from I think 1965, and it's a um, mm -hmm. and it's uh, basically this like really scathing um, um, satire of the communist state's bureaucracy and you know the hell it was putting people through um and it, it's like a kafka story crossed with a laurel and hardy comedy and um and it, it's well worth watching um it, it, and it's interesting that they could get away with that you know that yes. early in the um in the uh, revolutionary era yes uh, la muerte de un buruc burocrata yeah. La muerte de un buro, burocrata. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Martha Bueno has told me that the communist takeover took a while to complete. So mm -hmm. this was one of those things that might have slipped through the cracks before it was complete, uh, which is, yeah, I'm seeing it here. Yeah, it looks like it's a yeah, another. Naturally, I'm curious to know what kind of movies came out of, uh, came out of down there. But yeah, it's a. Uh, Cuba, but I know there is a. I know. I know Miami is certainly a huge, uh, huge center for a lot of Spanish-speaking, uh, you know, media being produced. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, when I was writing about, um, when I was writing about pirate radio, a lot of course Miami was one of the big centers because all these different immigrant groups who couldn't, uh, yeah. did not have a space for them on the uh, legal airwaves were, you know, starting their own private stations and. Uh, um, without permission from the government and, you know, broadcasting in Spanish and um, playing the kinds of music that they liked back home and selling ad space to, you know, immigrant businesses. And it was sort of this great entrepreneurial uh, uh, mixture going on. So, well, Miami is also considered a really good place for radio ships. If you do, you know, pirate radio off of a ship, cause you can, Oh, this was all, this was all yeah. like a dime, like um, a, on, on shore. Um, yeah. Offshore radio was never, um, big in the United States like it was in Europe. I mean, there are some high profile examples that didn't last very long. And part of the reason why is that if you wanted to do the kind of let's um, broadcast from over the border and not worry about the FCC thing, the easier thing to do is not to get yourself a ship and, and worry about it. It's to go to Mexico and go with the border blasters, which were legally recognized in Mexico. At, but um, up until they started having better relations with with the United States, and I think it was the '80s, they started, you know, then finally clamping down on being able to have these. Um, uh, but that's like where Wolfman Jack was, you know. I mean, and a lot of folks um, uh, were uh, just heading down to Mexico and um, renting time on these stations and being heard across a huge amount of the United States. So, with that option, um, you know, the offshore radio thing that happened in. Um, you know, Great Britain and other European countries was not 
as necessary. Um, also, of course, you know, even there was more freedom in terms of ability to get on the air legally in the United States than there was in a lot of European countries, too, because most of them at that point in history had just sort of socialist monopolies Certainly. on broadcasting. So, yeah, you know, uh, one one, you know, I. I, I I, I, I do wonder if, you know, I, I, I've read the books and seen the movies, what you would say about the Hunger Games. Uh, I think the books are more libertarian than the movies, though. I have not read them. I've not watched them. Yeah. Um, my kids have. Um, <laughs> uh, my, I remember my older daughter being really into them, and my younger daughter read at least the first one, I think the full trilogy. Um, but... Um, I think she liked the book better, books better than the movies too, if I remember correctly. I shouldn't speak for her, um, yeah. but yeah, but I, I haven't. I, I mean, my understanding is that they're kind of broadly anti-authoritarian, the way that all dystopian stories are, but not necessarily in a way that. I mean, you could project libertarianism onto it, but um, not in a way that makes those kind of extra points that something like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest does. Is yeah, it what you think or? I mean, I, as someone who's actually watched them, well, I think I the the books are more, much more capitalistic because they talk more about how the underground economy exists in the Hunger Games, mm -hmm. where everybody trades and buys stuff, and because idea because everything's this big big centralized planned economy from the capital. But at the same time, it seems like some of the socialists will see it as an anti-capitalist movie, but I don't see it as an anti-capitalist. I see it as a you know. But that's because of their warped perception of capitalism. Uh, you know, otherwise it's really it, yeah. So, and it goes more into the moral dilemmas of how they over, yeah. So you know, but people are starving because they don't have enough food because everything's centrally planned. Mm -hmm. You know, from the from the capital, but and everything's censored, and there's a a lot of things done. done. Uh, you know, it's a. Uh, I don't know, you know, you know what else we could say, but you know, uh, certainly I think there were, were some libertarian implications in all the Star Wars movies too. But I don't, I don't know if I, I there were, I've I've known some um, libertarian Star Wars fans who've said that I've I've never really kind of I mean I mean there's a kind of like yeah we're fighting the Empire kind of thing, but I don't know. Yeah, and we're fighting the Empire for somewhat free trade, but I also think you know it's there, there's some good one-liners in there too. You know, said. So, well, this is how liberty is lost with thundering applause. You know, it's a well. Well, I mean, someone like Han Solo obviously is. Yeah. You know, libertarians are going to be. Um, yeah. But there's also this whole kind of thing of like, here are the rightful rulers waiting in the wings. You know, that we should. Yeah, Han, Han Solo. Well, Han Solo is really just kind of like a modern, a more modern day pirate. You know, it's a smuggler. I mean, but he's in space. You know, it's but but he's got his own ship and everything, all that stuff like that. You know. But he just goes into space and does what he does, except except having a boat, you know. <clears throat> you know that, and, and not you know that's what that's what Clint Eastwood does a lot too. I mean, Clint East, a lot of Clint Eastwood's characters are kind of like Han Solo. Yeah, yeah, and of course, uh, in his westerns, is, you know, he's this guy who's just on his own, doing his own thing, just living his life, you know, and trying and trying to survive, but doesn't really have a home. And so, another um, dystopian one, of course, is is Brazil. I mean, which also has the yeah. kind of death of a bureaucrat thing where you're, it's both like a satire of bureaucracy. It feels like Kafka crossed with Laurel and Hardy. And in fact, in that case, there's direct nods to Laurel and Hardy. Um, and another one, this is not um, a famous movie because yeah. um, it was, we talked about being surprised that death of a bureaucrat was made in um, yeah. Cuba. This is when it was made in the Soviet Union in the twenties and promptly suppressed. Yeah and uh did not rear its head again till like it was like started being screened mm -hmm. around the, the 70s and then um in like the yeah. early 21st century you could finally like have like get like a dvd of it and it was like a proper proper release um but um a 1929 movie made in soviet georgia called my grandmother which is just again um it, it, there's this whole sort of mini genre of uh, movies where it's like we are going to um, uh, satirize bureaucracy with slapstick and anti-authoritarian politics. Um, but this one has that um, additional uh, 
the, the additional oomph of having been actually suppressed by uh, a dictatorship because they didn't like yes. um, what they were what they, what they were saying. Um, so it's that's one worth. It's called My Grandmother, and it, it's if I mean if you don't have patience for silent movies, which I know a lot of people don't, then you're probably not necessarily going to be swayed by this one. But um, it, I think it's very well made and obviously of interest to libertarians. And uh, yeah, you know Brazil, of course, was. Uh... You know, Terry Gillum made it, Michael Palin's in it, so it's kind of a, I suppose it has a, a Python-esque tone about it, yeah. somewhat. Wow, yeah, I mean, I remember when it came out, got... that was like me and my friends were like, oh, hey, the Monty Python people have been yeah. in there, but, you know, we didn't necessarily know that it was going to be, um, yeah. yeah, political. Oh, this my grandmother, uh, you know, I was in, yeah, that's interesting, I'm seeing it here, yeah, it's a... I wrote an so, article about it like almost 20 years ago when there was, um, yeah. cause I saw it, um, with like some live, um, with like the live music accompaniment and uh, I interviewed yeah. the, the person who composed the music and, and filed a piece for reason in like 2005 or six. Um, so it's, uh, and hopefully it's, I mean, at this point it's probably online, you know, but the, uh, yeah. the, the DVDs I'm still, I'm sure can still be acquired somehow. I get, you know, I guess also being a silent movie, it would probably be very easy to, uh, to, uh, you know, to make, to, to make it for other languages. Oh, well, you just, you just change out the subtitle cards. Well, I mean, it, it's very clearly yeah. about the, uh, I mean, there are jokes in there about like the young communist league or whatever it was yeah, called. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, it, it's very clearly a product of, but yes, yes, you can, um, the uh, it, it's easier to translate um, into other languages when you're just doing the title cards. Then, so I, I'm assuming it was made initially in uh, was it made initially in Russian or was it made it in Kartvelian or what? Um, oh, I, I believe Russian. Um, okay. Yeah, but I don't know. It's been a while since I. Of course, I mean, when I saw it, I was reading yeah. the uh, the sub yeah, not the subtitles, the cards. Um, well, you can certainly, it's certainly, I mean, look at the, looking at the names, it certainly, you can tell it comes out of that area. There's a, yeah, not my, I, yeah, they, they were never, yeah, they were never fond of the Soviet Union uh, down there. I mean, you know, I. Yeah, well, it was, it was also, yeah. um, there was a, a movement at the time called eccentrism, which this was, uh, at, which influenced by in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, which were um, like this was partly like people being influenced by you know Dada and the Surrealists, but they were also really into American pop culture. Um, they, they liked Pulp Fiction. They liked you know slapstick movies. They liked American music and vaudeville and, and all that sort of thing. And so, but the um, so it 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 has that um, that uh, it's not it's not just sort of legal locally specific to what was happening in Georgia. They were aware of what was happening in Moscow and what was happening in, you know, New York to some extent, because, you know, these were guys who like Chaplin movies and that sort of stuff. Yeah. You know, the, I think there were some libertarian implications in some of Chaplin's movies. Uh, well, Chaplin, he was a, yeah. he was a Marxist himself. Yeah. That's yeah. The, uh, I, uh, I mean, there was some anti-authoritarianism in it, though. I mean, if you watch, yeah, it, no, I, I agree. Theater. Modern times is, has is definitely something with the anti-authoritarian spirit. I'm not a huge Chaplin fan, and that's not for political reasons. I just think of like the silent comedians. I like Buster Keaton better. I like Charlie Bowers better. I like Harold Lloyd better. Because um, he, like Chaplin, had this kind of sentimental side where things would kind of just slow to a crawl while he's presenting the flower to the girl he likes. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm not as, um, that stuff felt very kind of 19th century in the, not yeah. in a good way to me. Um, whereas, you know, Buster Keaton, actually one anti-authoritarian side, there's a, it, it's not really a political movie, but there's a pretty funny Buster Keaton short called cops where he basically has the, um, over the course of it, the entire Los Angeles police department, um, coming after him. Um, and it's a fun one. It's a um, Buster Keaton likes having climaxes where he has just hordes of something following him. There's like a Western comedy where there's like a horde of cows mm -hmm. stampeding. Yeah. There's one where it's like there's all those boulders rolling down the the, the 
the mountain at him, and he's got to dodge them. And this one, it's it's like just hordes of people in police uniforms uh, chasing him across Los Angeles, and it's um, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. You know, I don't know if I've ever seen a Buster, a Bu- any Buster Keaton movies. Ch- Chaplin was, you know, King in New York is also. I don't know if you're aware of that speech from a King in New York where the kid is uh, talking, you know, talking about you know being brainwashed and stuff. It was. It, there was a time when I think leftists were a little more sincere about really wanting something better. Now I just think they're motivated by destruction. But that well, it depends on what left you're talking yeah. about, as always, you know. But and it's also funny too that you know Chaplin is portraying the kid and making him smarter than he is. I just I always enjoy that, you know, where the where the I always enjoyed in a movie where the kids seem like they're smarter than the adults. It's, you know. I've I've not seen uh, King <clears throat> yeah. Or, um, it's his last. Uh, couple of movies I haven't seen. I, the, anything after yeah. Monsieur Verdot, I don't think. Actually, I might have seen one more. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, he, he definitely went. Yeah, he definitely, I think he was, I think he got so, you know, he he, he got so into the, that, he was so used to doing silent movies that I don't think he made an adjustment. Of course, and of course, by then he already made so much money that he didn't have to make movies anymore. You know, it's a... Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I, I guess the story is too. You know that uh, who was it? Is one of his? You know, he, he, you know, he lost his visa, couldn't come back to America, and apparently one of his wives took all his money out and sewed it up and sewed it up in like a fur coat, and then that's how the, that's how the Chaplin fortune got out of America and and made it back to him. You know, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that story, but I yeah. know about his general, um, you know yeah. about his his uh, migration problem. Well, he also, you know, he also directed, did a lot of the production. So he was, he, you know, he not only. Oh so yeah, he, sure, sure. And Buster he, Keaton was so also. He was, he was making, yeah, he was making all the money too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Buster Keaton was also the director of his stuff, but then um, he made the mistake of uh, signing up with a studio, which gradually kind of destroyed his artistic freedom and reduced him to, um, yeah. it's kind of an unhappy, and he winds up being like a, sad alcoholic at the end of his life. Yeah. Um, but this is not like a, a necessarily libertarian nor anti-libertarian, just someone I like, but the kind of unsung um, silent comedy director who I really enjoy a lot is Charlie Bowers, um, yeah. who would do these um, really bizarre, surreal gags. He liked to do, um, he liked to sort of come up with a sort of absurd inv- inventions, you know, or and, have like cars laying eggs or whatever. Um, and his funniest movie to my mind is something called There It Is, um, which I just won't even describe. It's like 20 minutes, 30 minutes long. Um, and uh, you can Google it, it's online. And I, I enjoy it a, a great yes. deal. Yeah. Charlie Bowers, yes. And that's B O W E R S. Yeah, Charlie Bowers, yeah. ATF, yeah, yeah, silent film. Yeah, it's a, oh, you know, of course, you know, it's, it's, of course, a lot of movies from the silent era are completely lost. You know, it's even yeah. most even most movies before World War II are lost, unfortunately. I mean, it, the Library of Congress, um, <laughs> um, and I don't know how accurate it is, is that was that seventy um, percent of the movies, American movies from the silent era, are lost completely, and another five percent we only have part of. Um, so that's that's what's going to happen to all the streaming stuff. <laughs> it disappears a century from now. I'm, I'm afraid so, and it, you know, and of course, in in that area, and in, in that era, there there's a lot more of an excuse for losing it because you had film reels that took up a lot of space. You had a nitrate film stock, which was very flammable. I mean, I mean, a couple. I mean, there were two major fires. Yes. That that destroyed a lot of destroyed a lot of movies, uh, which was very sad. But na- na- nowadays, you, I mean, you you, you I don't. I mean, you could put a warehouse of film reels onto one server someplace. And well, the um, yeah, despite the flammability issue, yeah. um, the old analog film, uh, and they and there's been some change also in terms of it's less flammable than it used to be. Uh, does last longer. It's it's a better. I mean, there's yeah. there's there's a reason why you're not just um, um, you know shooting things on videotape or, or or so. I mean, like. There, there are like different capacities for different storage media. Um, but yeah, it's diff- I just did a, a story for a reason a, a couple months ago um, that was in part about this, um, which is why I had the yeah. statistics at the top of my 
top of my uh yeah. tip of my tongue for you was because um there's i mean thank goodness for the pirates basically because yeah. there's stuff that's disappeared entirely from um you know streaming libraries because it's it used to be you made more money by offering as big a uh, uh, a, a, a selection as possible but now they've sort of as the contraction happens they're saying well maybe it's better not to have to pay um the uh, licensing fees and the residuals and so stuff disappears and a lot of this stuff that disappears has never had um a physical release um but a lot of that stuff is also still available on you know BitTorrent, and yeah and that's basically the only way that it's now the people who made it aren't making money from it this is not the ideal solution at all yeah. I mean, that is, may be the only way that some of these things um, are still around, available decades from now, which has happened like with a lot of um, movies and TVs and uh, TV shows and yeah. audio recordings in the past. So, yeah, you know, yeah, this is something else I definitely, you know, the, you talked about it, you know, the pirate, the pirate preservationists. I mean, I, I, I have a personal example, Jesse. I, I was a big fan of the TV show Roswell. Mm hmm. Uh, which aired from 99 to 2002. So that was that area, you know, that area. time when time when people, you know, when, when almost everybody had a VCR, but this was before DVDs took off. So mm -hmm. you didn't have that case where, you know, they were coming out and putting shows on DVD. So I said, okay, this shows, this show might end up canceled. I'm probably never going to see it again. So I started recording every episode of Roswell on VCR tapes and I still have those tapes, but guess what happened when the DVDs came out? They changed the music. Oh yes, because and that, that was and that, for a and, lot of and and the fans yeah. were and and this is and what's kind of sad, you know, Jesse is if the producers had taken the time and the effort to go through all that, I think the fans probably would have paid the big ticket for the DVDs, but they didn't give the fans a choice because that's because there was that other show that was on that, that de also debuted in '99 called Freaks and Geeks that lasted for one season. Mm -hmm. They went back and got all the rights to their music, and they 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 had a one season season DVD, but it was like hundred bucks. But the fans bought it because they didn't. Yeah, there the music, was the music was part of it, and, and changing the music just doesn't, you know, it just. Yeah, there was some show. I'm trying. I don't remember if it was <laughs> yeah. WKRP or another one where the music was yeah. completely integral to it. Oh yeah, and, they, and then when they reissued it with uh, different music, it was like you were watching a different show. I mean, it just didn't make sense doing it this way. Yeah, was it WKRP, or am I thinking of a different? There was, something, there was something. If it wasn't that one, it was another one where yeah, um, where it was that level of importance. Yeah, WKRP was a WKRP was a big one. Uh, the the Wonder Years was also a big one. Uh, did they the music, did they reissue that with different music? I, I I think they may have, but the, but that was one reason why a lot of these shows just took a long time to get onto DVD because of all the licensing issues. Yeah, no, I, I well uh, that's something else. But it's it's always aggravating when yeah. the um, I mean the Wonder Years, like the '60s soundtrack, was part of when that was on oh, yeah. TV. I mean, like when the Simpsons parodied it. You remember the Simpsons thing where they? Uh, in, like, I don't remember the Simpsons parody. In one of the first couple of seasons, when it was more unusual for. Yeah. Um, for um, the Simpsons to do like these sort of direct parodies that later became just part of what it did all the time. They had yeah. something where uh, Bart looks towards the camera and you start hearing the voiceover in like the sort of one year's voice. And, oh, um, gosh, and yeah. then uh, Homer hears it and tells him, cut it out. And then they, and then they start playing turn, turn, turn behind it. And it was, it was very funny, you know? Yeah. Um, because, but that was like part, I mean, the fact that you're going to hear the birds on it is part of what, made it the wonder years right i mean it's so yeah if they reissued oh, yeah. that without yeah. the music that would or with different I, music one one of them you know yeah i i don't know what yeah it's funny you know you know one of the more obvious examples for me too you know you, you probably know the movie house calls with walter Matthau and oh Jackson. no i love walter Matthau. i, I have not uh, oh house you oh you gotta watch that movie it's so hilarious and walter and glenda walter and glenda are perfect i mean it's it's a great romantic comedy but there's this one era, era part where uh the in the original movie they play the song uh, something by george harrison right in later releases that song's taken out just replaced with stock music and it's like why and you know and, and even though it's not really important it's like why did you do that yeah oh yeah if you like walter matha you've got yeah it. no i mean he's one of those guys where their movies everything yeah. else is bad and he's the good thing you know like i yeah. uh 
Like, oh, like Hello Glenda, Dolly Glenda is like Jackson, one of the most. Glenda Jackson is great in that movie. Uh, yeah. Hello Arizona. Dolly, I found just like an incredibly yeah. tedious movie. And the only two things Art that made it watchable were yeah. um, Walter Matthau and Louis Armstrong, yeah. right? I mean, they, they still had those two. Um, yeah, you know, uh, you know, and I also, you know, I also wonder too, though, is, you know, there's this whole business of now them trying to sanitize things, uh, which, uh, which I find troubling. Uh, yeah, I mean, the good news is that, um, and this is also, this is also speaks to the pirate thing, because um, I actually, let me back up. Have you looked online to see if um, the versions of Roswell with the music that you have, have people uploaded those? Somewhere? You know, some people have. You know what's pretty common online, and, and apparently they're not getting cracked down on this. They will upload copyright st copyrighted stuff, but they reverse, they reverse it. So the left is on the right and the right is on the left. Oh yeah. So, or they will do so, the, so um, the thing looks, where you don't see the weird. entire screen. It, they yeah. do a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. It looks weird. And I, I don't know. I want to watch it the way it was meant to be watched. The, I, I think the rever actually the reversal isn't always so obvious, but it, it, but people do look weird when they're reversed. It's yeah, no, I, I, I know that yeah. because I can remember when my, um, when my kids were little <laughs> yeah. and there were like some shows they wanted to see that, we could only find like on daily motion sort of put up that way yeah. but because they were like sort of little kids shows it like didn't really matter it was like some children's programming is really well made uh, and yeah. some of it they just sort of throw things up yeah. um yeah no i've seen that and there's also the, what's really aggravating to watch is the ones where they sort of focus in only on part of the screen um oh yeah yeah, I hate that. yeah. and in that case you know you really can miss i mean mm -hmm. yeah. the reversal okay maybe there's some words on screen and you can't but it's um yeah it, it can it can actually be aggravating to happen. yeah and, and what's also kind of unfortunate too is i some people just don't just kind of sit on this stuff i don't know why uh you know it's uh yeah uh, so but what I, what I was going to say with the um with the stuff that's been sort of sanitized for uh, political reasons yeah. is in those cases, you can almost always find the originals still online. Yeah. Um, and that's, um, and yeah. that, that, that marks a real change. I mean, I, I, yeah. um, I remember arguing with someone, not arguing, having a disagreement, mm -hmm. friendly disagreement with someone when they uh, did the, uh, you know, when Lizzo's song was changed, they took out spaz. And they're like, oh, this is like the new dystopia where they can just completely eliminate like the old yeah. uh, version. And I say, just go to YouTube. I found it in less than a minute. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it, it's it's up right. there. Um, and uh, I don't. And anyway, yeah, it's um, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't have. I know how I was going to end that sentence, but yeah. Uh, well, there there was also the famous, uh, the somewhat you, you you certainly remember in Living Color, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There was the 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 video that Keenan Ivory Wayans did of the Bolt Forty Five, uh, which was a parody of Colt Forty Five, and yeah. they showed that once, and uh, and then Fox decided they were going to try to sanitize it. But this was in what you know what what like nineteen ninety, of course. So yes, somebody recorded that at home, and guess what? It's on YouTube. Yeah. In spite of uh, in spite of the fact that they wanted to delete it forever, but now, yeah. You know, because people were using VCRs then, you know, it's a. Yeah. The VCR really changed everything yeah. when that became mass adopted. And I talk about this in that article that there, um, mm -hmm. that uh, it was the first time when you really had, before that you had things being preserved um, illicitly in the sense that somebody who saved a copy that they weren't supposed to, like yeah. that's why we have Nosferatu, the German government, um, ordered every copy destroyed, but someone kept a copy and eventually made its way to this archive in France, yeah. you know. Uh, but now lots of people are not just um, recording things for their own mm -hmm. um, benefit like you did, but, you know, you yeah. getting together with friends. Like if you're a fan <laughs> of a, uh, if you were a fan <laughs> of a, like a British comedy or, t or science fiction show or a Japanese anime and it was 1990, yeah. chances are, you are going to see this because some friend of yours who's also a fan in those other countries sent you a yeah. tape and then you get your other fans to get friends together and you watch mm -hmm. it together and you make copies for other people. And this was, it's like this analog version of, you know, stuff that happens like much yeah. more quickly on online today. Um, but the VCR really, um, 
And I think um, if someone were to do a study of like uh, how much like TV is lost um, like year by year, and I don't know if anyone has said that story, but I would predict my guess would be, you know, the 1980s, there's a sudden shift and a lot of stuff yeah. is still around because a lot of people recording things. Well, um, well, you know, it, it's also been pointed out too, though, that, you know, because a lot of this stuff was still on film stock, it just wasn't economical to keep all of it. You know, it, uh, you, know you know, I have, I, I I don't know about you, but I have this weird nostalgia for old game shows. And so I I realized that a lot of those, you know, like a lot of the original Hollywood squares is gone. Mm -hmm. uh, mo, mo, it, 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 you know, if you go up to about 1980, a lot of the game shows are gone. I mean, they even and while, while there's a clip of it, while, while you can watch a clip of it, the, the original the original episode where Billy Crystal goes up the pyramid in 26 seconds is gone. Like the the full episode is yeah the full episode the full episode's gone now now there you you can watch a clip of it you know because you know going up the pyramid in twenty six seconds is pretty pretty impressive you'd have thought hey somebody you know you know and uh, you know also uh, you know a lot of uh, old Johnny Carson uh, that's gone so yeah so and he, yeah, and a and lot he of old happy when he found that out. Is, uh, there's a lot of this in sports and in fact the um, yeah. The first Super Bowl, there was like this whole case um, <clears throat> yeah. some years ago where someone had a recording because uh, this was, yeah. you know, before everyone had VCRs at their home, but somebody mm -hmm. had recorded it. And I think if I remember right, the TV studio, or I don't remember what, what situation he was in, but, um, and then there was like this whole question about whether he was allowed to sell it and who had the rights to it. And uh, um, of course, one thing with these, um, also with these old VCR um people who've saved these things in VCR, often the, um, the show has been preserved elsewhere. Maybe there's been a nice uh, DVD uh, reissue yeah. of it. Um, but on the, the version you've recorded at home, you've got these old commercials that before you wanted to scan past, but now that's what you're talking about being, I laughed yeah. at you, being nostalgic for game shows because I can be nostalgic for old commercials that I like no yeah. interest in watching at the time. Yeah, but yeah. Now, and and you know that might yeah. be like the one copy someone still has. Yeah. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's it's funny. Yeah. I yeah. When I find something like that, I, I I find these old commercials. It's actually kind of funny. And you know, there's there's one there's one uh, there's one video out there. It's very very low. It's very poor quality. But I think it's the the oldest uh, episode of Hollywood Squares that's known to exist anywhere. And it's, got, and it's, and it's up in three parts on YouTube and it's got the commercials and there's a commercial with Betty White in there. <laughs> I mean, it's so, it's so wild to see the, these commercials and just, it, it's, it, you know, you can tell because uh, people didn't really start getting VCRs until the eighties. They were a luxury item, but you know, it's mm -hmm. yeah. And there was a, uh, you know, the case too, you know, where, uh, you know, sometimes where a, t a TV station or something might find a copy of it, they found some old Super Bowls that way. Uh, 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 the most interesting story is that, that there was actually a kinescope of Game 7 of the 1960 World Series, which is by a lot of a, a standards, you know, a classic baseball game, but that ends with Bill Mazeroski, but it was found in Bing, in Bing Crosby's wine cellar. So it was preserved. And of course, somebody called, hey, uh, you know, do you do you think the Hall of Fame might want this? Uh, yeah, they probably will. So let's you know call them up and say, "Hey, you random. Want this? Um, yeah, you want this? I yeah, sure. It's a yeah, nice cool you know. spot to be keeping the uh, <laughs> yeah. you know keeping it in good shape." And um, then, and yeah, it, it, that's the thing because it was stored in a wine cellar. It actually was in really good shape. So they, yeah. So and of course, uh, you know, they put it out on a DVD, and you could watch the you know. Did, did they know the backstory of how Ben Crosby happened to have? this uh... he was part owner of the pirates and he didn't want to watch it live for some reason so uh yeah it's a so uh and and then they actually did a big production like they they got a bunch of people together and, and we did like a release at a theater in pittsburgh and showed it to everybody you know they mm -hmm. brought in all these baseball players and well, you might, and this is another one that was in my article, but you might remember because you were in the Northwest for a while, as, as I was, Cairo, yeah. K-I-I-R-O, radio. Um, during World War II, um, they were only supposed to, I mean, on the West, basically the, um, the news networks didn't want people um, time shifting um, their yeah. news broadcasts. And so if they, if they were doing their newscast at what would be five in the morning, mm -hmm. West yeah. Coast time, you know, 
tough crap. You you got to air it now. Well, they started recording stuff on acetate discs yeah. on the down low. Um, and then it was found like years later, all this. And this was um, mm -hmm. like the only preserved record of, you know, C I believe it was CBS's uh, yeah. day coverage. You know, I mean, it's I mean, like live there on the mm -hmm. well, not live because they recorded it, but, you know, um, on the uh, on, on the ground during D-Day. Um, and this is like, something of undeniable historical importance that basically existed because these people yeah. were making recordings they weren't supposed to. Yeah, what, well, you know, I can imagine watching old news programs would certainly be a great way of, you know, a great way to do archiving of history. I mean, just, you know, just if you, I mean, I, and I don't know if there'd be a demand for it, but can you imagine, for example, if you had a, an entire DVD collection of every, you know, this is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. You put all that out and you, well, there you'd, was... get a, you'd get a kaleidoscope of the news every day. And it's kind of, kind of interesting because newspapers are preserved, but but stuff like that really hasn't been preserved. It hasn't been. Well, there is like a, a place, a news <laughs> archive at Vanderbilt that yeah. has been recording this since the late yeah. 60s. And they started because um, this kind of eccentric right-wing businessman... Um, yeah. in Nashville, found out that uh, most newscasts were being wiped like two weeks after yeah. they aired. And he was, first yeah. of all, he was aghast for the obvious reasons, but also because of his politics. He was like, if I want to prove liberal bias, so I'm, I'm going to be able to prove. Yeah. So he started recording. And there was a big court case because um, yeah. a CBS, I think it was, one of the networks, mm -hmm. uh, wanted them to turn over the tapes to be destroyed. They said, you don't have the right to be recording this. Um, and um, Congress, when they revised the copyright law, while that was going through um, through the, the courts, Congress fortunately included a provision saying you're allowed to do this. You can make recordings of this for these purposes. Um, but they still can't put those online mm -hmm. in digitized form. You have to go on site to, to Vanderbilt University if you want to watch this, um, which, of course, lots of historians and journalists and others have, have done because it's this amazing. But... That only starts, you know, a little more than 50 years ago. I mean, mm -hmm. um, their pre-TV broadcasts of some networks are just gone altogether. Um, like a rumor that like one network's entire stuff was just dumped in an archive in uh, New Jersey. I, I, I had the archive dumped in a dumped in a landfill in New Jersey, not an archive. I thought there was the Dumont archive that was dumped in the New York Bay or something like that. Yeah, I, one guy was telling me a story <laughs> of one of the networks like sort yeah. of saying, hey, are he getting a call from someone there saying, hey, they're throwing out um, this stuff later today. Do you want to come over and see what they got? And he rushes over and salvages. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it's a, um, you know, the, the people who um, run these uh, companies are not, I mean, understandably, they're not in the history business. Yeah. They're in the news and entertainment business. Unfortunately, the law kind of gets in the way of other people who are in the history business mm -hmm. of saying, all right, well, we want to, you know, do our thing then. Um, you know, because that would be no. nice. If you could have the the the, uh, the voluntary cooperation and trade that and, well, uh, was, that we was like it, politically. So, if it was live, was it ever recorded at all? I mean, that's the question I'd ask. I don't know if it would have been recorded at all if it was live. I mean, you just send well, it out, and there it goes. You know, and it's gone once it's sent out. Yeah, I mean, in some cases that is what happens. In other cases, time shifting of some kind was allowed, you know, for rebroadcast in other markets. And therefore there was a recording somewhere. Um, but so much of what we have is just kind of like, there's, um, we have some, like a lot of musicians in the first half of the 20th century who could improvise at great length and very skillfully. We mostly yeah. have recordings of what they did for, you know, three minute releases. Um, oh yeah. Because that's, that's, that's what they had the technology to do. But sometimes they're for um, Fats Waller um, recorded uh, some long, like the Muzak Corporation. You know, what we think of with Muzak, this sort of, um, yes. uh, you know, elevator music. They also were doing these things where they were uh, having like Fats Waller in this case, um, uh, do like longer form recordings for that kind of Muzak purpose, you know, like music in public space. And as a result, Decades later, this we have this record of what you know him playing at greater length sounds like because he did it for Muzak, and that was not piracy in any way. It's more of just kind of a 
byproduct of um, of uh, a part of capitalism that you didn't expect to be, you know, yeah. salvaging this. But yeah, no, there's all sorts of stories like that. I wanted to point out too, you know, a lot of people say Monty Python would have been lost if it had not been so prevalent, had not been so widely distributed in America. That's very possible because the BBC yeah. was still dumping, um, or if not even just America, but the <laughs> fact that it was being sent to Australia and other countries yeah. where they yeah. have, because um, yeah, that's how they lost a lot of old Doctor Who episodes. Old, oh yeah, early episodes of the Avengers, um, not the superhero team. The uh, yes, yes, show. yes, Emma Peel, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, that, that version of the Avengers. Yeah, well, yeah, it has been an interesting talk, Jesse. I, I knew you'd be an interesting chat up. Well, uh, you know, we, we can find you. At, we can usually find you at Reason and, uh, you know, and you've got your occasional blog, but that's where most of your work is. And you've got your two books on Amazon. Uh, Any place else we should look for you? Uh, well, I should say the books. One is called Rebels on the Air. It's a history of, um, of uh, radio in America with sort of... Um, an eye on folks like the pirates, the sort of uh, yep. people operating on the margins. And the other is the United States of Paranoia. It's a history of American uh, conspiracy folklore. Um, and uh, yep. the, uh, I mean, the, you mentioned to me, I mean, that old blog basically exists only for the purpose of those uh, yeah. movie lists now. Um, but I um, I mostly write for a reason. Um, I had yep. a, the most recent, um, long piece to go up was this the pirate preservationists and i've got uh yeah. a new one that's going to be coming out in um a month or two i gotta look at the calendar on um yeah. very long one it's sort of the history of all black towns oh, in yeah. america and they get oh, into wow. Zora neil hurston and a lot of uh, yeah. uh it goes in a lot of directions you know the yeah. history of reconstruction and so on mm -hmm. and that'll be of interest to a lot of folks i think so um yes. keep an eye out for that I just I just sent a letter to Reason in response to their recent articles about Melee. I've done twenty one shows about Melee, Jesse. So uh, oh. I have some I have some knowledge of what's going on down there. Okay, uh, Javier Melee <laughs> might be the greatest libertarian of all time. It's oh my goodness. I thought you said Melee. I thought you were, I thought you were talking about the no. massacre. <laughs> no, I'm not. I, 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 I get it. Yes, Javier <laughs> this is a completely different topic. Yeah. Well, right. well, you know what's really funny, Jesse, is what, sometimes when the subtitles translate his name, uh, me lay also translates to my law. Oh, well, that's not <laughs> uh, necessarily. Yeah, so, yeah. But yeah, it's uh, kind of interesting. Well, uh, please like and subscribe. Please like the video, uh, thumb, thumbs up and uh, subscribe, follow the channel and uh, check out my novel Escape from the Village. Check out my somewhat irregular substack i'm chris baker uh my novel is escape from the village and we're out thank you for coming on jesse <laughs>